Well, I've got some colorful words for you, young man. Or woman. Or... Uh... Never mind. <laughs> colorful. Get it? Colorful. <laughs> colorful. Colorful B550M Gaming Frozen. This is the AMD B550 chipset motherboard. This is a micro ATX motherboard. It's from Colorful. This is a lower cost B550 motherboard at less than $130 that you can get it for here in the US. Probably less where you are, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, something like that. I've got our test system outfitted with the Ryzen 9 3900X. It is rocking a very respectable 4 point something gigahertz, basically a fully stock configuration with the stock cooler. And I'm also rocking a, an ASRock Phantom Gaming, uh, you know, add-in card, uh, basically a, I think it's an RX 580 for my GPU for testing and a PCI Express 4.0 SSD for the Windows testing. Then the Linux side of the testing, uh, use something a little different. But this motherboard is a vehicle which can be used to power your, you know, Ryzen 3000 series CPU or your Ryzen 5000 series CPU. Now to be clear, Ryzen 3000 series CPUs doesn't include Ryzen plus Vega. So the 3400G, 3200G, those CPUs don't count. Those are APUs, but this motherboard does have HDMI and DVI out. So it is designed for an APU. Probably those new cool like Ryzen Pro 4750Gs that are only available in OEM markets where maybe an OEM might choose a colorful motherboard with this type of an APU, which is based on Zen 2, or possibly even compatible with the coming Zen 3 APUs. Now let's not talk about APUs. 12 cores and actually 128 gigabytes of memory. This has got the OLOY memory kit, which is something that I ordered from Newegg because I'm a crazy person. All right, so let's take a look at the board layout. Now, as I mentioned, 128 gigabytes of memory, that is the maximum amount of memory that you can use with these Ryzen, you know, Ryzen 3000 and Ryzen 5000 series CPUs. And we'll talk a little bit about that because it does affect your memory speed a little bit, your maximum memory speed before you get into overclock territory. This layout has a single eight pin CPU power connector and the standard, you know, ATX style power connector. There are four six gigabit per second SATA ports. It's coming off the B550 chipset. Now the B550 chipset doesn't need a fan or anything like that. So it's just got a passive heat sink. It does have two M.2 slots. One of those is PCI Express 4.0 directly to the CPU. That's where our PCI Express 4 NVMe is for our testing. And then right below that, right next to it, as close as it could possibly be, is another PCI Express 3.0 by four M.2. That runs through the B550 chipset. In total on this motherboard, there are only four or four pin fan headers, including the CPU four pin fan header. So if you're doing a dual tower configuration or a water pump or something like that, you're probably gonna wanna use a, you know, a Molex to four pin adapter or an external fan hub or something like that for your water pump to make sure that your water pump is, you know, your AIO or whatever is running full time. But since this is a lesser expensive motherboard, you're probably gonna be using a tower cooler or maybe even the inbox cooler if you're getting this for a 3000 series CPU. Although those 5000 series CPUs are on the horizon and there's no cooler in the box. Huh, except for the six core. So that might be a thing. So physically this motherboard has two PCI Express by 16 slots and one PCI Express by one slot. The first PCI Express by 16 slot, the one that I've got my GPU in is electrically by 16 directly into the CPU. The bottom PCI Express by 16 slot is PCI Express by four through the chipset. It looks like all the pins are in there for PCI Express by 16, but actually electrically, well, it's only PCI Express 4 and it's through the chipset. It's not like a by eight by eight configuration or, or anything like that. The audio solution that Colorful has implemented is based on the Realtek ALC892. They did use Nishikon audio capacitors, so I can't fault them for that. The signal to noise ratio, like the noise floor is around 119 dB, which is Definitely not the best, but it is an eight channel audio solution. So you've got the full front panel connection as well as, you know, eight analog ports at the back, which is pretty good on a motherboard like this. So you can run up to eight channel audio with a configuration like that. So with the rear IO, as I mentioned, the HDMI and DVI, we've got uh, a combination PS2 mouse and keyboard port. That's great for people like me that are rocking older Model Ms, although I've also got the USB-C Model F 
which doesn't have to be USB-C, it's actually USB 2.0, but right below that's two more USB 2.0 ports. And then we've got a total of four five gigabit USB 3.1 ports. Now there's one type C and three type A. They are colored different. That's just to show you where they're connected. There's no 10 gigabit USB 3 here. Everything is five gigabit. Truthfully, I would have liked to have seen at least two more USB 2 ports or two more USB 3 ports at the back, but hey, two more USB 2 ports wouldn't have been a really particularly expensive option. At the bottom edge of the motherboard, we do actually have two USB 2 headers, so you can break that out into your own USB connections. We've also got the USB front panel connection, which is again, two more USB 3.0, five gigabit ports. And finally, the last connector on the bottom edge of the motherboard, that's an RS-232 header. Of course, if you wanna use a serial port with this motherboard, you're gonna have to get your own RS-232 header. Now for the burn-in testing, I used an AMD Ryzen 3950X because I'm a little bit of a masochist with a Noctua U12S tower cooler. I ran the ADA 64 uh, stress test. I let it run overnight. Nothing overheated and nothing melted. It was in sort of this open air configuration. There's a there's a there's an air conditioner vent directly over me. So it was getting airflow over the motherboard. Nothing really got past about 76 degrees C which isn't too bad. Even the VRMs weren't boiling, you know, around 70 degrees C, give or take. The uh, aluminum heatsink at the back here was warm, but not hot to the touch. If I have really any complaints about this motherboard, it's probably going to be the BIOS and um, the stuff that goes in the BIOS. See, the deal with AMD CPUs is you can use Ryzen Master and control things like your overclock and your voltage, and you can just set everything to auto and sort of manage everything with Ryzen Master, but it's still nice to have some options actually in a UEFI. Even the XMP profile option is a little sketchy because you go to the overclock section, okay, that makes sense because XMP profiles, that is kind of technically an overclock, and you have to set it to manual, but then when you set it to manual, you can tell it to load the XMP profile, and it just pre-fills the text boxes for you. Uh, in my case, I wanted to get 128 gigs of memory working at DDR4 3600, which to be fair, in the motherboard specifications, it does list 3600 as an overclock because it is technically an overclock for the AMD platform. AMD only supports up to 3200. Technically, when you're running 128 gigs, AMD only supports up to 2933. So 2933 would be the non-overclock. However, I had a lot of trouble getting this memory to post at anything beyond 2666 using the default BIOS settings going through the motions and plugging in the values manually and doing a little bit of experimentation, loosening the timings, like the timings on this memory, because it's 128 gigs is like 18, 22, 22, 22. I had to sort of loosen it down to like 19 and some other stuff. And that sort of got it to be a little bit more stable. And I reordered the dims and I reset the timings. And finally I upped the voltage to 1.4 volts from 1.35 volts. And that got me stable enough to boot. Still wasn't quite stable enough to pass extended memory tests or anything like that. But 3600 to 128 gigs works pretty well. Now this is the same CPU that I tried on the MSI Godlike. And you know, it worked at 100 and 28 gigs, 3600, and this is a launch day 3900X. We know that the IO die has improved because the 3900 XT can more easily achieve, you know, 3800 with smaller kits of memory. Fiddling around with that in a UEFI, UEFI did not have a lot of bells and whistles. There was no AMD CBS or AMD PBS options present. There really wasn't a lot of options in the BIOS overall for any of the, the knobs and tunable. It may not be important to colorful customers to be able to mess with those settings in the BIOS or, or change it or anything that you might want to do in the way of overclocking, you can use Ryzen Master for. So it's not a complete deal breaker, but it is something that you should be aware of. The thing that you're likely to run into the most trouble with is maybe PCI Express 4 generation speed. A troubling trend that I've noticed in motherboards lately is that it'll let you specify, you know, to force all of your slots to run at PCIe Gen 3, because if you're gonna use a riser cable or an extension cable or something like that, generally those only work at PCI Express 3 speeds. But when you set that option, it makes your NVMe and everything else also run at PCIe 3. Whereas the hardware actually has the support to run the GPU at PCI Express 3 and the NVMe at PCI Express 4, those options should definitely be exposed in BIOS. This motherboard doesn't expose those options of BIOS at all in, in any way that I could find. Now, it could be that I just missed it because it's organized weird, but I don't think it's there. In terms of Linux testing and Linux support, I just booted off USB and did a fresh install of Ubuntu 20.04, as well as Fedora 32. It installed, ran, everything worked correctly. For my GPU, I was using the RX, the, you know, the tried and true, the venerable RX 570, RX 580, 
Polaris. Basically, it's an older GPU, but it's rock solid. And everything worked out of the box, including the Realtek ALC 892 audio. And where would we be on AM4 if we didn't talk VRM? Let's remove the heatsink here so I can kind of get a good look at this. Now, the brains of the operation is a Richtek 3667BB. Yeah, it's a 4 plus 2 type configuration, uh, but it does have an onboard ADC that's accurate to plus or minus a half a percent with uh, built in overcurrent detection and some other nice features. I mean, it's rich tech, it's, you know, it's not, not the end of the world here. I think colorful and some of their stuff on this motherboard that I searched was like, oh, it's, it's 10 phases. It's not, it's not 10 phases. It's four plus two. You get the, uh, the plus two for the SOC and everything else at the top edge of the motherboard. There's not, a, there's not a heat sink on that. You don't really need it for AM4 and then everything else is, is four phases, but you do have a high and a low side, and they did double up on components. So each phase has two upper and two lower MOSFETs. This is a pretty common design from Colorful. Sometimes they'll use one upper and two lower, but two upper and two lower MOSFETs. It's the 6414A MOSFETs from AOS International Semiconductor, and the lower bridge is connected with two 6354 MOSFETs in parallel. They're all pretty much the same. This, you know, socket AM4 tops out at something like 142 watts. That's the theoretical maximum that you can get through here. These MOSFETs are rated at 32 amps. So even with a slight overclock, this is, motherboard is gonna be able to deliver AMD's specification. I wouldn't overclock it very much because, you know, just enabling precision boost overdrive with that 3950X, we're able to see some pretty significant uh, temperature spikes with this VRM configuration, even though this is a pretty hefty aluminum block. I mean, it's not exactly finned, but there is kind of, there's like six fins or three and a quarter fins. It's kind of a lot. It's not terrible. In the box, you've got a USB breakout header and a front panel breakout header, which is kind of nice for convenience sake, I guess. Two individually wrapped SATA cables. Again, sort of weird. Your, your bog standard, very basic IO shield. It does have punch outs for a, an RF modulator, but uh, remember to sort of bend the flaps back because you know, ethernet and <laughs> I guess USB was somewhat optional or RF shielding. So bend those, those back. And then an RGB cable. This is the four pin digital to three pin digital adapter. And you got a Installation driver CD, which colorful, honestly, you probably don't need that. You can save, you know, 10 cents by not including that. And then an installation manual, which is multi-language. The Realtek here is an older Realtek one gigabit chip, the uh, 8111, but colorful doesn't actually specify in the motherboard manual or any of the documentation what gigabit chip you're gonna get, just that it's gigabit. And so that may mean that depending on different runs or anything like that, they might substitute a different Realtek ethernet adapter, but pretty sure it's gonna be an inexpensive gigabit Realtek ethernet adapter. But again, this motherboard is around $100 US and it's, you know, the latest and greatest chipset B550. It really just depends on what features other motherboards have around that price point. If you can get another motherboard with a better UEFI or a better onboard NIC or, or better onboard audio for around the same money, then that might be a better deal. But as it is right now today when I'm making this video, which is Q4-ish, 2020, this isn't a bad deal for what it is. So I think that's pretty much it for this video. Colorful did send me this motherboard, but everything else is stuff that I bought or stuff that I already had, just sort of put it together. I don't get to see the review ahead of time or anything like that, full disclosure. I'm Wendell, this is Level One. I'm signing out and I'll see you later.